With no further ado, let me introduce our speaker of the evening. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. James M. Sullivan. He earned his master's degree and doctorate degree in biological oceanographic, uh, oceanography from the University of Rhode Island. Dr. Sullivan is now an internationally renowned researcher and leading oceanographer. He joined the Florida Atlantic Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institution in 2015 and was named their executive director in 2018. Dr. Sullivan is also part of Governor DeSantis's Blue-Green Algae Task Force. So without further ado, Dr. Sullivan. Thank you, Paul. Thanks. I also want to thank the Clean Water Coalition for having me come speak to you. This is great. It's a, a nice turnout. But one thing I got to start off with, and <laughs> you're probably going to, I talk pretty loud, um, is what I'm going to talk about tonight, you know, and I, I've given this lecture or some variation of this lecture a number of times. And the one thing I always hear at the end is, you scared me to death. You know, I, I really, this was the most depressing thing I've ever heard. My wife calls me Dr. Doom of the Algae Bloom. This is my nickname. And what I want to say is, even though, yes, you will see things that are like, wow, it's, this, is a, um, this is not a good problem, we can fix this. And we have organizations like the Clean Water Coalition. We have the National Estuary Program. We can fix this, and we are in the process of doing it. So even though some of this may be depressing, don't worry about it. We, this can be changed. So I think it's important just to say that right up front. Um, so I'm going to talk to you, as you can see the title of my talk tonight, about water quality, specifically about harmful algal blooms, because it's, a, it's an issue um, that's plaguing Florida right now, and some of the human health threats in all of South Florida, but also in the Indian River Lagoon. I mean, this is what most of us live around and is near and dear to our hearts. So what are harmful algal blooms? I think everyone here probably knows what they are. But quite simply, they're just occurrences of phytoplankton. Phytoplankton are algae, um, in another term. And they have to cause some kind of negative ecosystem impact or some kind of impact on humans. And you can see um, on this slide, there's different types of harmful algal blooms shown here. And the one thing that strikes you is what from this picture? A lot of different colors, right? You know, so we have... Uh, a red tide, red tide, brown tide, green tide. This was kind of a yellow tide, uh, another one. And it's like, why is it like that? Um, before I get into that, I will tell you that phytoplankton or algae are microscopic plants, um, which means they're very, very simple organisms in some ways. However, this particular one you're seeing right here is called a dinoflagellate. It's a type of algae. This would be the same kind of organism that causes Florida red tide that you've heard about. And you've noticed one thing, these can actually swim. So a lot of times when you see red tide or green tide or any of these different uh, harmful algal blooms, you see them right up at the surface. That's how you know they're there. Well, a lot of these algae have adaptations that allow them to get to the surface so they can collect light. They're plants, you know, they need light. <clears throat> so they aggregate there and they can actually shade out all the other plants in the water. They get all the light, plants below them don't get it. So they can like, take over an ecosystem that way, and they're really well adapted. And the ones that can't swim, like this one I just showed you, they can actually get little gas bubbles in them and float to the top. So when you see the blue-green algae blooms that make that big green scum on the surface, they have big bubbles in their colonies, and they just float right to the surface and, and stay there. So to get back to the color um, issue, on the top here on this slide, these are pure cultures of different species of algae. And you can see that whole rainbow of colors. Just like your house plants or the plants you see driving around in your neighborhood, they're different colors. Sometimes, you know, a lot of them are green, but some are red, some are yellow, um, various colors. Phytoplankton are no different. They're, they're plants. And the color that they have are the pigments they use to absorb light. So they can be quite different. And you can see on, a, on here, some are very red, some are very green, some are brown. And that corresponds to when you get a whole bunch of one species of algae that has a particular color, then it discolors the water. And you get a red tide, green tide, or all the various things. 
Um, so how do these phytoplankton, or these harmful algal blooms, actually grow? Well, like all plants, they need three things, basically, to bloom or grow. They need optimal light, and the higher light promotes faster growth. Just like if you put your plant in a dark closet, it's not going to really grow that well. Put it out in the sunshine, it's probably going to grow pretty well. They need an optimal temperature. So warmer temperatures for algae, and you know, aquatic algae, generally promotes faster growth. So the warmer it is, the faster they grow. And they need optimal nutrients. Just like you fertilize your lawn, you fertilize crops, they need nitrogen, they need phosphorus. The more nutrients you give them, the more of it grows. I mean, just like fertilizing crops, same exact thing. Uh, so you get a sense they're, they're just plants, and that's how you have to look at them. So when you're trying to worry, you know, why do we have so, harmful, harm, so many blooms and these harmful algae um, are growing, well, they're just responding just like any plant basically would. So how are they actually harmful? Almost everyone knows uh, this top part. They can produce toxins. Not all of them, but a lot of them can actually produce toxins. Some of the toxins I've put up here, saxitoxin, microcystins, brevitoxin, domoic acid, these are all found in Florida waters. Different algae will make these different toxins. So that's pretty straightforward. Everyone understands that, that they can be harmful. But they can also be harmful in other ways, even if they're not toxic. They can create high biomass, which just means a lot of algae. Um, so when you see something like this, that's a lot of algae. And when you have this high biomass, it can cause what's called hypoxia or anoxia. So you have this big biomass of algae, and it sinks down to the bottom and it's when it dies, and it starts to rot. And that, that rotting and that bacterial degradation of the algae sucks up all the oxygen out of the water. So the water can go anoxic, which means no oxygen. And that's when you get very large fish kills. So that's what happens with it. Um, the algae themselves are also very much like us. During the day, they do what's called photosynthesis, just like any plant, and they produce oxygen, which is great. But at night, they do what's called respiration. Essentially, they breathe like we do. They use up oxygen. So if you have a lot of algae in the water and a lot of algae dying on the bottom, it's a double whammy that both processes are sucking oxygen out of the water, and you can have a system turn anoxic overnight. Uh, they also do shading when there's a high biomass like you see here. Well, think about all the plants like seagrass that are underneath this. No light is getting to seagrass if you have this kind of thing. So they shade out the other competition from plants and other algae so that they can take over a system uh, a little bit better. Algae can also cause mechanical damage to other animals. So some of them produce mucus which for shellfish, like oysters or mussels or certain clams, the mucus they produce gums up their, the shellfish feeding apparatus. So the shellfish has to clam up, it can't, it can't feed, and they can die. They can starve to death. Uh, they can also produce what are called surfactants. It's a chemical that breaks down oil. There was actually a harmful algal bloom out in Monterey Bay that wasn't toxic, but when it came to the surface, it produced this really nasty surfactant that the seabirds got into their feathers and it broke down all the oil in their feathers which actually insulates a bird. Without it, they all got hypothermia and died. So they had this massive die off of seabirds just due to this chemical that wasn't toxic that these algae were making. Uh, they also, some of them have hard shells and they have serrations on them like little knives. And when it gets into the gills of fish, it'll cut up their gills and actually kill them. Um, so just this mechanical damage can be quite the issue. And the last one I think uh, everyone be aware of is the economic impact. No one wants to have this behind their house. No one wants to come recreate in that kind of water, or nor should they. And having people see this when they you know, come to Florida and swim in our green water, that's, um, it's not a good thing. So it really hurts tourism. It hurts recreation. If your house is on the water and you always have this behind it, your property values are going to be affected for sure. And it hurts fisheries and other uh, economic powerhouses, essentially. So um, this is where we start just getting, you're probably getting depressed right now. Uh, <laughs> these are not the headlines, and I just cut, these are headlines I cut from various news sources last year. 2018 was a bad harmful algal bloom year. And these are some of the headlines, and there were hundreds of them that I just cut out and you can see 
Uh, Florida tourism, not seeing green as toxic algae chokes business. A lot, you know, they, the estimates are there could have been billions of dollars of uh, economic loss last year, potentially. Algae threatening home values. Toxic algae is slaughtering marine life by the masses. Uh, are toxic algae, you know, making people sick? I mean, this is not good. We don't want to see these kind of headlines. Unfortunately, um, this isn't going away anytime soon, which is a depressing thing to say. We're going to have to get through it. The reason I say that is that worldwide, these harmful algal blooms are increasing not only where we see them geographically, but in the type of algae we're seeing, the frequency that they bloom, how often it occurs, the duration of the blooms, how long it lasts, and the severity. Just, you know, how much toxin they produce, what is the environmental and economic impact. So if you look at this really simple graph behind me, this is 1972, and the dots, you don't have to know what they are, they're different colors and different symbols. They represented in 1972 the different kind of harmful al algal blooms that the United States reported. There were very few, there were like four different things going on um, and widely dispersed around the United States. This is what it looks like now, and this isn't even close to being accurate with all the small blooms that happen. These are major blooms that make noise, or make news. Um, and you can look at two things. You don't have to see all the symbols, but there is a whole bunch of different algae that were never a problem before in the United States that are now pretty much everywhere um, in different areas. And if you look where I circle Florida, we're probably the most impacted state in the United States. We have a really wide variety of different algae that will bloom in our water. And then think back to what I told you before. What do the algae need? Abundant light, sunshine, warm temperatures, it's Florida, <laughs> and lots of nutrients. And we're providing all three of those things in spades. Um, so again, not the happiest slide in the world, but we're going to have to deal with it. So from looking at that, you'd probably ask yourself, well, why, why is this happening? Well, I've kind of given you... Um, the answer, but we'll go through it. Eutrophication is probably the number one reason. Eutrophication is a fancy word for nutrient pollution. So we're essentially fertilizing our coastal waters, our watersheds, and the ocean. What's going to happen? They're filled with plants, potentially these harmful plants. They're going to grow. Plenty of light and warmth. The second is um, global warming and climate change. So again, the warming of our oceans, and it's happening, um, whether you believe in climate change or not, the oceans are getting warmer. And that's doing two things. I told you already, it makes, it makes algae grow faster, for sure. But it also increases the ranges, the geographic ranges that algae can survive in. Because if when we used to have colder, cold, you know, colder weather, like in Florida, for instance, I mean, at one time I heard it snowed in Vero Beach. Is anybody alive down there? Do you think that's going to happen anytime soon? No, probably not. That kind of cold snap may have kept algae that could not survive through that out of the water. But now if you don't have that colder temperature during the winter, algae that never could persist here now can. And you see the same thing with invasive plants moving up through the United States or up through different climate zones because the climate's changing. So we're allowing these different algae to start being able to live in our water. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's an issue. And also another thing that happens with climate change is we do get changing precipitation. Uh, this happens for sure. We get more intense storms. We get persistent rain uh, at levels we probably haven't seen before. When you get that increased storms, you get increased rain, now you get increased runoff. And what is the one thing that runoff does? It generally carries nutrients from one place to another. It gets into septic systems. It gets into areas where there's nutrients and it starts to flow into our watersheds, and it gets out into the ocean. So it just, it quickens that pace of fertilization, essentially. The last um, issue is a large one, and I, I could speak a whole hour on this. I don't have time to go into it. But as humans, we're modifying the ecosystem. We're modifying the land. We develop our coastlines. We develop inland. And that comes at a price. You know, how we develop land has an effect on the environment. That changes how we, we manage our water. How we manage our water changes how water gets into our ecosystems and what it carries with it. 
we dredge, we change how water flows, uh, we create canals or, or take them away. We also, as humans, transport some species of algae or other organisms into new areas they shouldn't have been. They can go in the ballast from a boat. Um, this used to happen back in the 80s. They figured out that some harmful algae from Europe were in the ballast water of the big tankers coming across, and when the tanker comes across the United States, it dumps its ballast water. That's part of what they do. Well, they discharge this algae from across the ocean over here, and vice versa. It happens both ways. They'd introduce an invasive species into our water. So again, humans uh, were making that happen. And we change how the food chain works. Algae are eaten by other things. But if we change the type of fish that are there and what those fish feed on that normally eat the algae, suddenly algae that used to be able to be kept down and wouldn't grow can grow because their natural predator is gone. So humans do a lot of things to ecosystems, and a lot of times it's not obvious how that problem's gonna actually end up hurting us. Really depressing is it's actually forecast to get worse than it is now. And that's why I say this isn't gonna go away like tomorrow for any um, quick solution. The fourth National Climate Assessment, assessment came out um, just less than a year ago from the government, and one of the big headlines in this climate assessment, and you can find this on the internet if you want to read it, it's uh, pretty long, is that climate change says red tide will become more common in Florida. And when they say red tide, they just mean harmful algal blooms, not just red tide. And, you know, scientists have been saying this for a while, toxic algae may thrive as climate and oceans warm. Well, I've just told you why, so now you know why this is. But this was a big take. This was a big um, take-home message from the climate assessment for the southeast, for where we are. So you're probably getting the sense. I showed you all the different colors and the different types of blooms out there. There are many different types of harmful algae, and they are very, very different from each other. Some are the. This is microcystis. This is a blue-green algae that grows in Lake Okeechobee and in the St. Lucie estuary. They're tiny little cells that live, at a, live as a colony. And they're actually bacteria, but they're plant, they're, they're bacteria, but they act like plants. They, they conduct photosynthesis. This is a dinoflagellate. Um, it's a chain, so there's four cells there. This is a, a diatom, a different type of phytoplankton. And this is actually Oreoumbra, what causes the brown tide uh, up in the northern Indian River Lagoon. Very different, different sizes, a lot of different species, each one that reacts differently to the environment. Because there's so many different types of algae, there are many different <laughs> types of toxins that are potentially going to affect you if you're exposed to it. Each one of those toxins can potentially have a different effect if you do get exposed to it. So it's kind of hard to see, but we have toxins that can give you paralytic poisoning, just like it sounds. It can actually cause paralysis in your muscles. It can kill you. There's diuretic shellfish poisoning or diuretic poisoning that can uh, essentially give you diarrhea and make you not feel all that good. Uh, there's neurotoxic shell, uh, poisoning. There's amnesic poisoning, um, can make you forget, start to give you brain problems. And there's ciguatera. Most of you are probably familiar with ciguatera. It's um, fish poisoning that you can get if you eat fish like from the Caribbean. Uh, so this is just some of the things that can actually happen. These are all different toxins from different algae. They're going to affect your brain or your body differently. Now, the way you can get exposed to them is also um, kind of different. You can get it in drinking water. So freshwater algae, like blue-green algae that, that grow in Lake Okeechobee or a freshwater um, drinking source, that toxin can actually get into the, water, into the water supply. Generally, they treat it to try to you know, make sure it doesn't, but occasionally the toxin gets through. Who here heard of the Toledo water crisis in Lake Erie? Yeah, so a few people. Um, that was a case, and I was actually working in Lake Erie right when that happened. I was out there studying blue-green algae when it happened. Um, they forgot to turn on the water treatment, and all this blue-green algae pretty much untreated got into the drinking water. So they had to shut down the entire drinking water system for the city of Toledo. This is millions of people without water, and it took them, I think, two or three days to clean the system out. So it does, unfortunately, happen. You can also um, breathe it. Some of, this, some of the toxins that algae make are what we call volatile, you know, like paint fumes or gasoline. The toxin gets into the air, 
and you can breathe it and get exposed to it. If any of you were, have gone to the West Coast during a red tide outbreak, or you had last year, you went to the beach in Vero, what happened to you? You were probably coughing, your throat got sore, your eyes got red, you were being exposed to a neurotoxin called brevitoxin. Um, and it's simply just by breathing it. That's all that had to happen. Uh, you can eat toxins. This is probably the, the, the most common way that toxins get into human, humans. Phytoplankton are the base of the food chain. So they're what keeps, and most phytoplankton are good. We need them. Without them, the, the whole ecosystem would collapse. But they feed little smaller crustaceans. Those crustaceans feed small fish. The small fish get eaten by bigger fish. So any toxin in these algae can actually get up into the food chain and eventually get into fish, shellfish, things that we eat. Um, and if we're not careful, we may eat a contaminated fish and um, get a, a pretty high dose of toxins. So that happens as well. And you can also get exposed to it recreationally. You can go swimming in water that has a lot of toxin in it. Will it kill you? Probably not, but you're still getting exposed to a, a toxin. It's probably more dangerous for what it could do to your pets, potentially, because when they get in the water, we don't generally drink water when we're swimming, but dogs do, and other animals um, might. So there's a lot of roots just through straight recreation. And if you combine, you're out recreating on water, and you also got an algae that makes a volatile uh, chemical toxin that gets into the air, well, now you've put yourself really close to it. So you might get a higher exposure than if you were inland a little bit. Two things can happen when you're exposed to toxins that these algae make. You can have an acute impact, which is immediate, and it's typically severe, just like during the red tide. If you went to the beach in Vero when the red tide was out there, you'll start coughing. Your body is telling you, get away. Just, you know, you're having an acute response to this. Your body's trying to protect you. If you eat contaminated shellfish or a contaminated fish, a lot of the toxins will immediately make your mouth tingle and make it numb, and you're gonna, you'll know, hey, I ate something that's not right, and then you'll start feeling sick, and your body will want to throw up to get that toxin out. And that, we're, you know, usually if it doesn't kill you, you'll probably survive. So your body can, <laughs> I know, <laughs> I told you it was gonna be hard. <laughs> um, you know, your body, your reaction will generally save you. Um, the bigger issue is chronic impacts. So the acute impacts, we know what happened, you got exposed to it. The thing we know very little about are the chronic impacts to these toxins. And this is a low level dose that you're getting exposed to over many years, over time. What is that doing to your body? It's like chronic exposure to lead or many chemicals that we now know are dangerous and become carcinogens or whatever. And you only feel the response to the toxin over a very long time period. I mean, it could be years before you actually have a neural effect or some other kind of effect. This needs a lot more research. And this is something I say all the time when I talk to politicians and other scientists and anywhere I am. This aspect of what harmful algal blooms are doing to us as humans and our risk we need to deal with this. We need to put the investment in studying this long term. And we're fundamentally not doing this right now anywhere in the United States. So what are the current HAB threats in Florida? I think everyone here probably knows Florida red tide and blue-green algae. It is not the only thing that's going on. Those make the news, but these other things are still going on. Uh, this might be kind of hard to see, but you can see all these different circles on this map of South Florida. Each one of these and its location is a different type of harmful algal bloom that is currently either blooming or is a you know, recent threat, has happened or will probably reoccur. Up here is, uh, that's Oreo Umbra, probably non-toxic, that's brown tide. But you can, just, you can go down and just start looking at all these and it's like, wow, there's a lot going on. <laughs> and I just put this around Lake Okeechobee and the Caloosahatchee and um, over to the St. Lucie Estuary to rep represent blue-green algae. But blue-green algae actually blooms in a lot of different lakes in Florida. So that's just the major thing um, that there is. But now you're getting the sense, wow, it's not just two things. We have a lot of different things that are going on. So I'm going to start going through these one by one so you get a sense of what they are. So Florida's red tide is caused by a dinoflagellate, one of those things that can swim. 
so it can come right up to the surface, and that's why you see that red streaking in the water from the color of it. It's an organism called Karenia brevis. This is a really significant problem on the west coast of Florida. It's been happening over and over again. Last year, and actually started in 2017, it went for almost a year and a half, was one of the more severe blooms that Florida's had in a while. It was so bad, it actually got all the way around the bottom of Florida over to the east coast. So this was a significant bloom. It was extremely large. And I'll talk about it just a little bit more in a second. Um, hopefully this will not become a significant problem over here. It produces what's called brevitoxin, which as I said before is a neurotoxin. In humans, it'll give you nausea, vomiting, numbness, re respiratory distress, uh, depending on how much you get exposed to it. In marine life, it is devastating. It is widespread death, because they, they're in the water. They're getting a lot of brevitoxin, and it will, you know, it will kill a human if you get enough of it in it, enough of it in you. But last year, there were extreme fish kills on the West Coast, and I don't know if people saw it here, but a lot of the counties had to pick up dead fish off our beaches, too. It is devastating to marine life. Um, it's a nasty toxin. I don't know of any report of brevitoxin ever killing a human. So as bad as it is to marine life, our response of coughing and, and getting away from it tends to save us. So I don't, you know, and that, that's an acute response. The chronic exposure to brevitoxin, I have no clue what it's doing to people on the West Coast. But they're starting to be exposed to this over and over again. I mean, I hope it doesn't have a long-term um, effect on people. So this is kind of hard to see, but this is the red tide from last year. It actually started, if this graph is the west coast of Florida, uh, there's little dots on here, the gray ones, and it's hard to see, but the gray ones mean there was no really detectable algae um, in the water. And then it's like a heat map. The white ones mean, oh, there's a little bit more algae. When they start to turn a little bit yellow, that's even more algae. When they're red, that's a dangerous amount of algae. That's a lot of red tide. So it really started in April of 2017. It went along. It was kind of around the Tampa Bay, uh, Fort Myers area. It spread out by June. July, it started spreading a little bit more. And then once it really got warm, what happened? Warm weather, warm temperatures, it started to grow. So in August, September, it was red in a lot of places. This is what happened in October of last year. What do you see now? Well, it's way up here. It's around where it normally is seen uh, in the central west coast. It's down in the Florida Keys, which was, in a minute, I'll tell you why that's important, and it's up and down the east coast of Florida. So you ask yourself, how did this happen? You know, how did we get it over here? So this is a generalized um, uh, schematic of what the major currents look like that are around Florida. So in the Gulf of Mexico, we have what's called the loop current. It's kind of way offshore. But it eventually goes down into uh, down by the Keys, and we get the Florida current, which then, when it makes the turn to the East Coast, becomes the Gulf Stream, which almost everyone's familiar with. So what happened? We have these currents. This is the way they move. We have this large bloom that starts to spread. It gets into the Keys. When it's in the Keys, it gets caught up in the Florida current. It gets into the Gulf Stream, and then it just starts getting picked off over to the East Coast. We had a lot of onshore winds in October, so it just blew it over to us. And there it stayed for almost a month, month and a half. Um, so when we see these large blooms on the west coast, when you start to see them down by the Keys, that's when it, you get worried because it can get picked up by those currents, and those currents are almost always there. So um, it can spread pretty easily. So that algae didn't actually just grow here on its own. It got transported over here from the very large bloom on the west coast. So this is a map of, uh, that comes from FWC. They put this out every week. It's great. You can find this on the internet. If you're curious where red tide is anywhere in the state, we have great monitoring for red tide. You can look at this. Uh, this is the map. There is not a single white hit on here. They're all gray. There's really no Karenia detected around the state right now. That's fantastic for now. <laughs> this will happen again. There's no doubt about it. Um, but anyway, it's good that it's not here. So what are some of these other HABs that are going on? That red tide one, you probably, you've all heard about. These other ones, maybe not so much. 
So down in the Keys and in the Caribbean, we have what's called ciguatera, fish poisoning. Has anyone heard of ciguatera? It's, you know, yeah. Has anyone here had it? Usually there's a few people. No? No? Oh, good. Um, and it's called, again, by adenoflagellate, one of these ones that can swim around. It's called gamber discus toxicus. Um, the Miami Herald published this story, I think, last year that there's probably a lot of more ciguatera fish poisoning than we actually get recorded. People eat a fish, they get sick, and they recover. This, this will not kill you, generally. Um, <laughs> but, you know, people just get sick, they get better, and it doesn't get reported. So it may be happening a lot more than we know. But when you get ciguatera, you feel sick, you vomit, you have diarrhea, muscle pain, hallucinations, not a good day at all. Um, the issue with ciguatera is it's really common in the Caribbean for a reason. The Caribbean's nice and warm, nice warm water. As temperatures warm in Florida, ciguatera could start coming north. Now, gambardiscus, the algae that dinoflagellate that causes this, is found in the Indian River Lagoon. It doesn't bloom and, and get to any kind of density that I don't think ciguatera has ever been reported um, in the IRL. But as the water gets warmer and warmer, these things may be able to start surviving and growing a little bit more. So this is one of the ones that that range may change. Also down uh, in South Florida, in Florida Bay and actually Biscayne Bay too, we have a saltwater cyanobacteria or a blue-green algae um, that has, is becoming a problem. And this is not toxic that we know of. It's an organism called Cynococcus. And we get these very large blooms uh, in Florida Bay. And this is that kind of yellowish green water you can see down there. And it's a, a serious problem, even though they're not toxic. And that's why I told you earlier, they're still dangerous, even if they're not toxic to anybody. It can cause that anoxia and hypoxia, when that algae actually starts to rot away. It can cause fish kills because of that. It can cause seagrass loss. This is a big thing. I mean, there's so much, you don't, there's not much light getting to the bottom of the ocean when you have that density of algae absorbing the light. And it can also contribute to making the coral just a little less, less healthy. It starts, you know, coral need light too. They actually have a symbiotic plant that lives inside them. So if they get shaded out, it's gonna affect them too. Our reef track is already in trouble with coral disease. This just it can exasperate that problem. So I'm going to talk about what's going on in our backyard. What's going on in the Indian River Lagoon right now? Most of you might think, well, the lagoon's fine this year. There's nothing, nothing out there. Uh, so in the northern part of the lagoon, up into the Mosquito Lagoon, we have what's called brown tide. This is an organism called Oreoumbra. Again, we don't think it's toxic. There have been people that have, have um, hypothesized that it may make a toxin. If it is, it's not. Um, it can't be that that bad. This can cause hypoxia and anoxia, again, low oxygen, fish kills. It also can cause devastating seagrass loss. Again, it shades out the light up there. We have a red tide. It's one of those organisms in the class of, you know, it's a dinoflagellate, and we, we call them red tides, of this organism called Pyridium bahamets. It's in the Banana River a lot and the Northern Indian River Lagoon. It produces a pretty dangerous neurotoxin called saxitoxin. Um, not good. It can give you paralytic poisoning. What's something we're seeing now, and I'll talk about it a little bit later, we're seeing an emerging potential threat. Um, there's an organism called Pseudonychia, which is a diatom. It's not, it's different from adenoflagellate, a different class of algae. And it produces an even more dangerous neurotoxin called domoic acid. We're now seeing pseudonychia widespread through a lot of the Indian River Lagoon. And we're measuring domoic acid, this neurotoxin, in the water right now. Now, is it, you'll never notice it. It doesn't make large blooms. It's not going to discolor the water. And it doesn't come to the surface. So it's not something that you're ever going to notice is actually there. Um, but we're seeing it, and hopefully it won't get worse. Who remembers the super bloom, 2011? Does anybody here then? So that was another case of what's going on down in Florida Bay or Biscayne Bay at times. We have these really thick blooms of um, saltwater blue-green algae, cyanobacteria, and other organisms that grow at the same time. 
which again can cause anoxia, hypoxia, fish kills, and seagrass loss. And that was probably one of the bigger issues with the super bloom, is it really wiped out a lot of seagrass. Most people are probably familiar with this. Lake Okeechobee gets big blooms of freshwater blue-green algae that get Dis when the Corps of Engineers has to discharge, they get sent down into C44 and into the St. Lucie estuary, and we get green tide or blue-green algae blooms from an organism called microcystis. Microcystis makes a chemical called microcystin, which is a very dangerous liver toxin. It's a hepatotoxin, so it will dissolve your liver if you're exposed um, to enough of it. Microcystis also, because it floats on the top and makes that like guacamole water that people see, it does all the things the other algae do. It, it, it shades out the seagrass, it can cause hypoxia and anoxia, it can cause fish kills, I mean, it can do all those things as well, but it also is toxic, unfortunately. And the big one I put on the last one is Karenia. This is Florida's red tide. We had it last year. So if the blooms on, the red tides get worse on the west coast, we're probably going to expect some spill over here. That, that event that happened last year, that could become more common. Hopefully it won't. So for the Oreo Umber Brown Tide, if any of you went up during 2016, um, and it's still going on in some aspects, the water looks like chocolate milk. I mean, it is brown, really brown. And this photo probably doesn't do it justice, but that's what the water looks like. Um, and in 2016, we had one of the largest fish kills ever recorded in the Indian River Lagoon. Again, one night, the whole area just went hypoxic and oxic. This is, these are all dead fish in the canals. I mean, it was devastating. It made CNN, it made national news. It was a large, large fish kill. Oreo rumber is still up there. It's been living up there and blooming since 2012. Now, this year, it's not that bad. Last year, it was pretty bad. It was getting close to, like, 2016. I put up this one paper here, and it's hard to read, um, but this isn't the first place this brown tide has occurred. Laguna Madre, Texas, had a bloom of Oreo Umbra that lasted for over a decade. Didn't go away. This has been going on since 2012. Some years, it'll be bad. Some years, not so bad. This year, it's not as bad. But that doesn't mean it's gone. It's still there. I talked about this organism, Pyridinium bahamens. This is the stenoflagellate that grows in the Banana River in the northern Indian River Lagoon, and it produces saxotoxin, this bad neurotoxin. Uh, there is a permanent prohibition on taking puffer fish from the waters of the lagoon because of this organism, potentially. We have seen some very strong blooms lately. It's been in the Banana River in the northern IRL since like 1997. This is a really long-term um, issue. And it seems like the blooms, unfortunately, are getting stronger. So in 2017, and I think this year, um, maybe a repeat, we're seeing pretty intense blooms of this organism up there. So we see high cell numbers and over a large area of the lagoon. Now, when we've been up there, we've measured somewhere between 3 and 8 micrograms per liter of saxotoxin in the water at times, and that number means nothing to any of you, but I'll tell you why it could mean something. For states that actually have regulations for closures of toxins and waters, which Florida really doesn't have, I think we're going to be getting some soon enough, and I think the task force are going to address this too, that we need to have the EPA and the state set closure levels for toxins and waters. Um, so in Ohio, their recreational closure for saxitoxin is three micrograms per liter. If you measure that much in the water, you're not supposed to go in that water. It's recreationally closed. We were measuring between three to eight. So we were measuring over the threshold that in Ohio would have closed that water mass. Why is this interesting? This is why. So in Florida today, there's this nice article that says, Authentic Florida, check out these 18 things, add to your travel bucket list. One of them on the list made me kind of sadly laugh. There is this um, business up around Merritt Island, which is mesmerizing lights. You do kayak tours for bioluminescence. The water glows. When you, you know when you go down to the ocean and you, know, the little, you see the little sparkly light, and it's called bioluminescence. The bioluminescence up in the Banana River in the northern Indian River Lagoon in the summertime is so predictable, someone started a business around it. So it's like every summer, and people do it right now. They're, they're doing it. I know they're doing it this year because it's a really good year for it. 
Why is it a good year for it? Pyrodinium, this toxic algae, is the species that's creating that light. <laughs> Pyrodinium is very toxic. <laughs> if there's a lot of bioluminescence, you're recreating in water that probably would be closed. So we're telling people to come to Florida to visit our harmful algal blooms. I mean, that's what this says, but I don't advertise it that way. Um, see, you laughed a little. <laughs> so I asked this question about this pseudonychia thing we're seeing in the lagoon now somewhat bothers me, and it's like, are we ready for these kind of emerging threats? And this is a very serious question. Pseudonychia has been a long-term problem on the west coast of the United States. It's a huge problem in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, it's a big problem in Monterey Bay in California. It's been going on for a long time out there. It now appears like Pseudonychia and blooms of air are getting a foothold on the east coast of the United States. So my, old home, my own place, I, I'm originally from Rhode Island, uh, this was in the Providence Journal. For the first time ever last fall, toxin-producing pseudonychia algae bloomed in Rhode Island waters and other parts of New England. And this was the second year in a row it happened. A reappearance of this neurotoxin that can cause memory loss and brain damage is worrying to scientists. Well, it should be worrying to everybody. But Rhode Island had never experienced this before. And Rhode Island, Narragansett Bay, is a pretty clean bay, but still it has nutrient pollution problems as well. And now they're seeing it there. And there was a study that came out in the early 2000s that essentially has um, postulated that pseudonychia is one of these algae that really can respond to eutrophication, nutrient pollution. It does well, like these algae that cause harmful algal blooms. So maybe it's not a surprise that we're starting to see it. It's got over here, it's in our water, and now we're feeding it correctly. It likes the environment it may get a foothold in the lagoon. I hope it doesn't, but it asks, you know, this is gonna keep on happening. New algae are gonna get in, new algae are gonna bloom. We have to keep on monitoring. We have to be prepared for this. Because they start to occur in these places where hey, we're not looking for them. We better be, because we don't know what they're doing. <clears throat> and if we're not ready to detect them, you know, that's the first line of defense. And are the local authorities ready to deal with them? You know, what's going to be our response to these things? So monitoring is incredibly important. We need people out there checking our water all the time. So let's talk about this one. This, uh, since I'm on the Blue Green Algae Task Force, this is near and dear to my heart. This is a picture of Lake Okeechobee. And I don't know if everyone can make it out, but you see all this green slick on the lake. Um, that is a very large scale bloom of blue green algae or microcystis. This produces this liver toxin. Um, you can see it from space. Lake Okeechobee is a big lake. This is a lot of algae, a real lot of algae. Um, and it produces, as I said, a hepatotoxin, a liver toxin. Now, the bloom itself is not restricted to Lake Okeechobee, unfortunately. As most of you probably know, when the lake level gets to a certain height, we don't want the dike or the earthen dam to break and drown people out there. So the Corps of Engineers has to release, release water. Right currently, it goes east and west. It goes into the Caloosahatchee, goes into the C-44, gets into the St. Lucie Estuary. Um, so it's spread out. Now this year, you haven't heard about really blue-green algae over here. What they did, the Corps of Engineers did before the rainy season started, was to drop the lake level very low. So they brought it down to about 10 and a half feet. So it could take a lot of rain before they'd have to discharge. I think now the lake's at 12 and a half. It must be getting close to 13 feet. I don't know if they're going to have to start discharging, but I'm really curious what all this rain we're now getting, because we had a pretty dry, wet season to begin with, what that's going to do. This could make the bloom. There is, there is a bloom out in the lake right now. There is, you know, toxic algae out there. It may get that bloom going, and if we keep on getting rain, the core may be forced to discharge, in which case we are going to see it over here. Don't know if that's going to happen, um, but it could. So, as I said, these microcystis blue-green algae blooms come through C44, and this is a picture from the St. Lucie estuary, and it gets really thick. It comes in um, pretty thick. And then you're, you start seeing signs like this. And it's good the counties put these up. 
avoid contact with the water. Shouldn't be going in this water. It's dangerous. Um, so I applaud them for being proactive in doing that. These warnings don't only apply for humans, and some of you may have seen this story that just came out of North Carolina. Um, but in Martin County last year, we had some dogs die and some dogs get sick. And a paper just, just a week ago got published on it. You know, they did autopsies on the dogs that died, and they also looked at the dogs that survived and got treatment. Um, and sure enough, when they actually did the post-mortem autopsy on the dog, they found the liver was basically destroyed. So the dog got a very high dose of microcystin, which will immediately attack its liver and, and cause organ failure. What just happened, I, guess, I think it was North Carolina, three dogs got killed like almost immediately. Their owners let them go into a, a small pond that had a really, <clears throat> really big bloom of cyanobacteria in it, microcystis. The dogs are in the water drinking and playing and licking themselves, and they just died in a matter of hours, as is said. So it's not just humans. If you see these things, don't let your pet go near it, because they don't, you know enough not to drink the water, hopefully. Your pet does not. And it's not just Florida. You know, I showed you the graph earlier. These blooms are occurring all over the country and all over the world, not just the United States, not just Florida. Again, from my hometown, um, this was just this week. Seven um, good-sized lakes in Rhode Island are now, now have pretty substantial blooms of blue-green algae in them, which is kind of another, a new thing for Rhode Island. Lake Erie has had a persistent bloom every summer of cyanobacteria for over a decade. Uh, it's a consistent problem up there. And you see headlines like this. Microcystis, this toxic blue-green algae, is becoming like a scourge across the world. It is everywhere. It's in China. It's in, all over the United States. It in, uh, feeds into San Francisco Bay. It's up in the Great Lakes. It's in Lake Champlain up in New England. It's in a lot of different places. It is highly <laughs> adapted or good at exploiting nutrient-polluted waters. So when we pollute with nutrients our watersheds, we're given this algae um, an easy time. And it's in all, you know, pretty much any freshwater body. But if you put a lot of fertilizer in there, essentially, and, or a lot of nutrients, it's going to grow. And it, it's, it's well positioned to take over a system. And it's not just Lake Okeechobee. Um, as I said, it grows in a lot of freshwater areas. This is uh, Tyler Treadwell wrote this article at Blue Green Algae are in Indian River County's headwaters. It's in, um, uh, God, I'm spacing on that name, Blue... Um, Blue Cypress, it's uh, commonly in Bruce, uh, Blue Cypress Lake as well. So, you know, you can't just say, oh, it's Lake Okeechobee's problem. No, it's pretty much everywhere. This is the really disturbing part. Um, not only is the blue-green algae causing these economic and environmental impacts, you know, we, we know that. I've just showed you many examples of it. There may be a direct human cost. And I'm not saying this is definitely true, but... It could be. This study came out in 2016 or 2017 from Ohio State, and they looked um, across the entire United States for these clusters of, of where blue-green algae blooms were happening, and then people dying from non-alcoholic liver disease. So, you know, they, did, they wanted to take out the people that were drinking themselves to death, but people that their livers were failing and they were dying. Um, and they found the only place, the only place, only cluster they found in Florida were the four counties of Indian River, Martin County, St. Lucie, and Okeechobee. So um, correlation is not causation. does not mean that that's what did this. But as a scientist, it's disturbing, for sure. And that's why we need these long-term health studies. We have to find out, is this real? Or is it just a, you know, cor you know it's just correlated, doesn't really mean anything. We need to figure this out. We need to know what our risk is, for sure. So what is the state doing? And the state does, this is where we get to hopefully the happy part, <laughs> or somewhat happy part, that we are responding. The NEP is working on it. The state is starting to work on it. My institute, Harbor Branch, is working on it. What is the state specifically doing? Ron DeSantis, um, through an executive order, created the Blue Green Algal Task Force 
of which I'm a member. I'm standing behind the governor here when he announced it. Um, and he just said that the state of Florida is also going to revive its red tide task force, which I believe Dwayne is on <laughs> over there. Um, so we have some really good scientists working with the state now. And this should be very encouraging to all of you. They want to hear from scientists. They want science-based solutions. And they want to listen to us. How do we start tackling this problem? This is a great thing and should make all of you very happy that the state is trying to respond. Um, I, I think it, it's really good. If you're interested in what the task force does, there's actually a really nice website uh, that you can go. It's on part of um, the Florida Department of Environmental Protection's website. I put the link up here, but you just search Blue Green Algae Task Force, it'll come up. You'll find it. The mission of the task force, and this is not the entire mission, but this is kind of it in a nutshell, is to guide and expedite improvements in DEP's regulatory and policy structure to improve our degraded water bodies. I mean, we need to solve this problem, and that includes looking at the water quality standards, BMAPs, TMDLs, um, things like that. How do we get to nutrient reduction as quickly as possible? Remediation, restoration, um, public health, getting new technology, or at least exploring new ways to do it. All that is within the structure of what we can do. I'm sure the Red Tide um, task force will be very similar. That we're going to, and hopefully, we'll work together. As I said, the task force was established by an executive order. We have regular public meetings. We've already had one, two, three, I think three, and we're going to have our fourth uh, next week up in Gainesville. And we're under the Sunshine Law, which means that anything we talk about is public. We do not talk in a back room. As scientists, you can come and see us at any of one of the meetings, and you can give public comment and say your piece. If you don't like what you're hearing, you can say it. You can send in comments, and we get them. We look at them. So a lot of, a lot of different groups actually send us um, comment. We expect to be giving the first recommendations to DEP and to the governor in September. So we've had a very aggressive meeting schedule. We're going to have a meeting, like I said, about in a week. Um, towards the end of August, and then we're going to meet right again in September and develop a set of recommendations so DEP can start action now, um, which, again, is a good thing. The one caveat I'll say, even though it's great they're doing these task force, Florida red tide, I think I've maybe convinced you of this, Florida red tide and blue-green algae are not the only harmful algal bloom problems we have. You know, we've got to look at it holistically. We really have to look at everything. We can't just put all our money in these two things because there's other things going on that could be just as bad if we don't deal with them. And what I think will probably eventually happen is the two task force will probably unite and become what we used to have, which was a harmful algal bloom task force, which means let's look at everything. You know, the same things are controlling, probably controlling red tide and blue-green algae. It's nutrients. <laughs> I mean, a lot of it is to do with nutrients, somewhat climate change. So, we don't have to do them separately, but I understand why it's being done, but I hope, I hope at one time we'll start to come together and deal with it, all the problems that are going on in the state. That's where Harbor Branch comes in. So why I can't control what the state does, I can control what my institute does. So what are we doing? We have established what's called the Florida Center for Coastal and Human Health, and I've got to recognize the Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute Foundation gave us the seed money the past two years to actually do this. Kathy Kisman is right here. She's CEO of the foundation. Um, very indebted to her for doing this. It's great that um, we can do this. What are we trying to do at this center? We started it in August of 2018. We want to get together all the expertise we can get within the FAU and Harbor Branch um, system with our scientists and other research partners that we can get to work together to look at the HAB crisis holistically. We're not just going to look at one thing, we're going to look at all of them if we can, and really start to understand what are the health impacts to our population. I mean, we want to know what's happening to the environment, we want to know what's, understand what's happening to our fish and our marine mammals, but I'm most concerned what's happening to us, you know, because I live here too, and I have a son, and, you know, I want people to grow up knowing that their lagoon is, is safe and healthy. And eventually, if we can all work together, we can get to that healthy environment and a healthy population. I truly believe we can. So, you know, all is not lost. 
What we're doing, and a lot of what I do as part of this center, is to recruit public stakeholders. So we work with the counties and the Treasure Coast to be public stakeholders. Um, but we, more importantly, recruit strategic research partners. The money we have for harmful algal bloom research and you know, water quality research is not extensive. We do not get a lot of money for this, and we beg for money to do it. Because we have such limited resources, we can't duplicate effort. We can't have scientists, oh yeah, I'm gonna study the same thing down here. We have to collaborate. And with our limited resources, we have to make sure we're using those resources as wisely as we can. So the more we work together and don't duplicate effort, the more bang we're gonna get for our buck. And it's really important to get people working together. Plus, the more brains you got working on it simultaneously and talking, you come up with better ideas. So we really are trying to get a lot of different groups to work together. And most of these groups you see up here are working with us in one way or another, um, either officially or through other means. Um, and what are we doing? We're obviously doing research. So the important thing is we want to understand this problem better. So we're conducting a lot of critical research, and most of it's in the Indian River Lagoon. Um, we are out doing toxin screening across the entire lagoon for a suite of toxins. You know, we're not just looking at microcystin, we're looking at saxotoxin and domoic acid and trying to keep track of what's going on in the lagoon. Uh, we are looking for, for new toxins that we don't even, you know, we don't even know are out there. There may be algae growing there, we're not, you know, quite sure what they're doing. So we're actually starting to investigate are there toxins we don't even realize are there right now. We're looking at how the toxins are getting into higher food levels. So we're looking at dolphins and turtles and other higher level organisms as sentinel species. If we start seeing toxins in dolphins, there's a good chance it's in us because they eat fish, they eat things that come out of the ocean. So we wanna look at that trophic transfer. We wanna understand how are toxins coming from the phytoplankton and getting up into the food chain and eventually to us. We're doing a lot of monitoring, some of it with the help of the NAP, actually. Uh, and the one thing Harbor Branch is doing that I don't know if anybody else in the state is really doing is we're actually testing people directly. So last year, in 2018, when we had the bad blue-green algae bloom down in Martin County in the St. Lucie Estuary, we were out there collecting blood, urine, nasal swab samples from people that were recreationally or occupationally exposed to these blooms. We need to start collecting this baseline data. If we're gonna figure out what's going on long term, we need to start getting this kind of data. It is critical that we do it. And we're trying to continue that effort now. Hopefully, we'll get to this point where we're integrating science for better management. So we're doing observation of the blooms, our monitoring, we're looking at trophic transfer, or what we call biological indicators, where there might be toxins, like in dolphins, for example. We're using our best technology. We're using satellites and remote sensing to look at the whole lagoon at once because it's really expensive to go out and send somebody to sample the whole lagoon. Um, so remote sensing with a satellite that can see the whole thing, a much more efficient way of trying to look at where blooms are. We have a really nice real-time uh, real water quality monitoring network, the Lobo system um, you may have heard of that Harbor Branch runs, which is constantly taking samples every hour on the hour, 365 days a year, so we can understand how the environment is actually changing and potentially stimulating these blooms. Um, we're also looking, as I said, at human health and ecosystem health, and all this is feeding into, in theory, the center itself, so we can integrate all this research from our strategic partners and the work we do and get to start to prediction level, that we can understand what's going on and risk assessment. So I can tell you if you say, is it safe to eat the fish in the lagoon or should I be swimming in this lake? Maybe I could actually give you a good answer to that. Um, and finally, get that information out to our public stakeholders, get it out to the counties, get it out to the state, so that we can start affecting better policy and ultimately get to where we wanna be, which is a healthy environment and a healthy population. So I think we can do it. We just need funding to do it and, and expand what we're doing. And that's where I come to what can you do? <laughs> so um, don't forget about this problem during the off season. When I say off season, I mean you know during the winter or now during a year when it's not that bad. And it's not that bad this year. Educate yourself, volunteer when you can. We do uh, some citizen science projects. 
If you see discolored water, don't be afraid to call Harbor Branch and report it. If you suspect a bloom somewhere, we'll probably go check it out. Pressure your representatives, state representatives, federal representatives. Tell them you want money and action to be put into this problem. I am always begging for money. Research is really expensive, really expensive. And this kind of research is chronically underfunded. And doing the kind of health studies I'm talking about are incredibly expensive. You've got to follow people for a decade. I mean, this is how we found out about lead poisoning and other problems we now take for granted. That was only done through very long-term studies to see the health effects. It, we got to start doing it. We have to start doing it. So um, if you win the lottery, come see me. I would love a donation. <laughs> so with that, I will take your questions. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Sullivan.